Good morning. It's December 22nd, 1992. This is part of the Heritage Series for IATSC 659. And today, we're in the home of Pascal Wexler, the famous cinematographer and distinguished member of 659. Good morning, Haskell. How are you? Uh, hi, Jay. Very extinguished member of 659. Hardly extinguished. Yeah. We're really uh, fortunate to have you here. I know you're, you're pretty busy and you, you've just come mm -hmm. in from parts unknown and you're going off to parts unknown quickly. Uh, but we, we do want to take a little time and, and talk about uh, your heritage, your mm -hmm. background and history, and, and we want to thank you for letting us come along here. Usually what we do with these is we start off with a little bit of personal history, where you came okay. from, what kind of educational background you had, uh, what, uh, how you got into 659. Could you, could you start with... Uh, well, uh, starting with the last part of the question, how I got into 659, uh, it's like the question of how do two porcupines make love and it was very carefully uh, so getting into 659 was a tough thing uh, I was born in Chicago I started my career in Chicago as a documentary filmmaker uh, I worked out of Chicago um, all around the world actually shot um, features in the south features uh, I mean uh, uh, westerns in South Dakota uh, later I worked in Europe and um, uh, then I uh, moved to California because one of, the, one of the companies I worked for in Chicago opened a studio, bought the Chaplin Studios, in fact, and they wanted me to continue working for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had, um, <clears throat> I had difficulties getting in to 659, and so I had to live in L.A. and work in areas that were part of the Chicago locals area. Well, when did you get the bug to be a cameraman? What uh, prompted you to, to get into this? Uh, I mean, it wasn't your family's business or anything. It wasn't, uh, you had no, no previous connections with it. Uh, just one day decided that's what you wanted to do. What happened? I think when I felt the excitement of taking my Bolex and making little films and editing it, that there was some, uh, some great feeling that I had, some feeling of discovery and control and... Um, images that uh, that I, I enjoy. It was a, it was a sensual experience. So it, I didn't like decide I'm going to be a cameraman. I just knew that that's what gave me pleasure, and I would do anything to be able to shoot movies. This is when you were a teenager. Uh, you had, uh, uh, yeah, when I was a teenager, and then later on, um, there was a period where I was a merchant sailor, and uh, so and we didn't take pictures then. Uh, and then after that, with some exploration into other fields, I felt that uh, movies was the way I, I, I really wanted to go. Well, it's all very fortunate for us because you, you've yeah. uh, certainly attacked the field and you, you mastered mm -hmm. it. And uh, mm -hmm. who are your mentors? Who taught you uh, what to, to do? Did you kind of figure it out by yourself? Did you go to school for it? Yeah. Well, uh, when I started, there were no schools. There were uh, photographic schools for still photography, but there were no cinema schools. So I learned, uh, I learned from everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, there were uh, old newsreel guys. I assisted on the regular newsreels, and, and they were extremely colorful, aggressive, uh, interesting people, you know, very competitive. And uh, we worked with like a, a single system a wall camera or a pancake Akeley and they have an IMO and it'd be my job as an assistant to um, to get up and run with these guys to, to, to be able to take a, a Akeley gyro tripod with a single system wall and throw it on your shoulder and and go and they would go and when you put the camera down you're supposed to put it down level and at his eye height mm -hmm. and uh, meantime he's reloading the IMO and uh, it was it was quite exciting. And I learned a lot of things about, uh, about how they work, too, which... So covering uh, news events. Uh, covering news, and also they would do... A lot of news events were, were repetitive, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, there's a certain area in, in Mississippi where there was floods every year. And so the, uh, one of the... Red Feldmiger, the newsreel guy from Paramount, would cover the floods every year. And um, so I went out with him, and there was floods that flooded farmers' land, and big areas where the water was up at the level of, of the housetops. And he, he said to me, uh, 
go find me a dog. We were in a town near where the floods were. And so I said, okay, I'll find him a dog. And, and so I found a little stray dog and I took him and then we got in a rowboat and we rowed out to this house that was, the roof was just above the water level. And uh, we rowed around and, and he put the dog on top of the roof. And then I rowed and he took the IMO and did the shot of the dog on top of the roof. And he said, every year, that works every year, the, the dog on the roof shot, you know. So these guys, you know, they, they weren't completely dependent on reality per se. They made their own little documentaries. Well, know? this was representative of the tragedy and, the, and, and, yeah. and oh, what that, happened. Yeah, that, that's, that's what they wanted. And, of course, newsreels were in all the theaters and, and before television. That's how people got their visual news. And the newsreels were subsidized secretly by, by the government. Uh, so that they never took any positions contrary to the establishment mm -hmm. positions. I mean, they began uh, the first shots. You'd see big, big Navy battleships shooting off Big Bertha mm -hmm. cannons and so forth. And it was, uh, and it was the government did that for good reason. Is because the newsreels were exported all over the world, and um, so they gave subsidies to the major companies like Paramount and Fox. Uh, Didn't and Universal, that. yeah, sure, sure. and, and they, they, they gave uh, subsidies to them, so that paid for, because the newsreels didn't make any money for the companies, mm -hmm. and if it weren't for the government subsidies, there would be no newsreels, but with that, with that government subsidy came an implicit uh, uh, idea that uh, it should represent the positions of the government. Mm -hmm. So we, you didn't get any 60-minute type things. No, you didn't get any real investigative reporting. No, like, like no. We, we know of it today, no. where they really dig into it, they really no. try to get the, the dirt out of it. That's true. Well, uh, so this was all uh, before World War II? Uh, or no, this was um, after World War II. After World yeah, War II? 1946, um, 1947. We, well, we've heard the story about how you, when you were in the Merchant Marine, you, yeah. you went down on two ships disappeared beneath you. <laughs> it gets amplified all the time. I was, I was only on one ship that actually went down, and it was um, uh, in the Indian Ocean on Friday, November 13th, 1942. The Chicago paper said, uh, boy mariner tells jinx day torpedo wing, so on. <laughs> but uh, uh, beyond that, as, as some of you guys know, uh, who were in the Merchant Ring, uh, it was the most violent and then deadly aspect of all the services, the percentage of people, of men lost in, in, in battle was higher than even the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. um, so I was shelled many times and buzz bombed and uh, on the Murmansk run to um, uh, up in the North, North Atlantic where uh, we get dive bombed. In fact, I was the f only um, merchant sailor who can claim to have shot the uh, foremast off another Liberty ship. Because, oh, good. Yeah, the the dive bombers would come in over the convoys, mm -hmm. and they would and they would head shop. They would just go mast height and water level and try to let their torpedoes go or machine gun. And I was on a 20 millimeter machine gun, and when the dive bomber was coming over the next one, I let go. And of course, there's no secrets because every other shell was a tracer. So you could see the mast of the Liberty ship next to it just oh, get no. cut right down, like no. yeah. And so uh, it was well; everybody knew this, but uh, that was it. Okay, so when you came back from yeah. from the war, that's when you uh, your interest in photography really blossomed, and when you yeah. got really going with it, yeah. and uh, you got involved with the newsreel. Is that how you got into the Chicago local? Is that how you got? Uh, in? Well, what happened be, actually before I was assisting on newsreels, I. Um, I was ma I made little documentaries for um, for good causes for a crippled children's camp for um, uh, there was a sort of a civil rights group in Mount Eagle, Tennessee. Uh, I made union films. I made some films for United Electrical Workers. None of them paid anything, but uh, um, it was good experience for me. And they used the films since it was before television, they used the films to show in meetings and that type of thing. And then, um, um, then I guess, oh yeah, I guess then my father was kind of disgusted with me because um, uh, I had trust funds and things like that. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yes, he said, well, what do you want to be? Because he wanted me to go into business. And, and, uh, and uh, he, he said, what you should be is a chemist. And 
So I said, well, what do you, what do you mean? He says, well, you're, you're the only one I know that can take good money and turn it into shit. <laughs> so, so, uh, so. Thanks, Dad. So, so, yeah. So I, so I said, uh, uh, I said, well, I want to make movies. So he said, well, what do you have to do to make movies? I'll help you. I said, well, I don't know. You have to have a studio, and you have to have lights, and you have to have camera and all that. So um, he said, OK, I'll buy it for you. <laughs> so so he, he, he bought, uh, actually, he rented. There was an armory in, in the suburbs of Chicago, and he rented this armory, which is no longer used. And I had built offices in it. I looked in a catalog, Mo Richardson catalog, and bought I uh, bought lights, I want two of these and three, I didn't know anything, you know. And, um, and I hired a real cute secretary, I remember her, then she got married. Uh, and, um, and then and I bought a Maurer camera, $1,250, which was incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. And then I said, okay, now I'm ready to make movies. And, but nobody, <laughs> nobody wanted to make movies. <laughs> so, so, uh, um, so anyway, my father had a friend who owned a cotton mill in Opelika, Alabama, and it was the 50th anniversary of the cotton mill. So he talked my his friend into commissioning me to make a movie about his cotton mill. And he explained that he could take a big tax deduction to pay me to make the movie and it wouldn't cost him anything. It'd be Uncle Sam's money. So I made this film called Half Century with Cotton, which is about a, uh, a cotton mill town and about it was a company town, so I did a lot of shooting of the uh, of the um, of the kids in the school and and um, the workers in the plant. It's a little more of a human story. And when I delivered the film to the guy who owned the plant, he said, "What is all this crap about the school and these kids at home?" And so I I have thirty five carding machines, and they cost forty eight hundred dollars a machine. I want a piece. I want to see all those machines. I want to see. So I had to go down there, go back, and uh, at that time, and I got a regular union crew because mm -hmm. if you wanted to rent lights and if you wanted to do anything of any scope in Chicago, you had to go to um, Bob Duggan and Studio Lighting, and you had to um, you had to go first class, which was union. Mm -hmm. And um, so we went down and shot uh, five days of long shots in the, in the factory. And um, it was at that point that uh, I, I really decided I, I wanted to get into the Chicago local. And the Chicago local was a lot more open than the um, West Coast local. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I got in. And from then, I decided that I better, um, I better learn um, from the bottom up, a little, that I mm -hmm. that I was just pushing too fast and too far, as far as um, my own ability, and so then I did. I worked as an assistant. I worked as an assistant in a lot of uh, Hollywood movies that came into the Chicago area, mostly in uh, in South Dakota. Quite a few westerns made in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. a number of pictures in Chicago. A couple of Alan Ladd pictures. Uh, a Jimmy Stewart picture and worked on. Uh, Do you recall some of the cinematographers you worked for? Oh yeah, oh very well. Um, uh, John Seitz, terrific cameraman, and uh, uh, Harlow Stengel was his assistant. On uh, a, lot, a lot of the West Coast guys were really very, very supportive mm -hmm. and helpful, uh, teaching us a lot of things. Because in Chicago, there's a limited scope of what you could learn about uh, about movie photography. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could see it. Harlow would have uh, these nets for John Seitz, and, and he would take a cigarette and just put a lighted cigarette in the middle of the net and then quick stop it and then use that. And, um, and uh, then practical things like threading Mitchell, threading the, the uh, standard Mitchell and the um, uh, and the uh, NC. Mm -hmm. later on. So you so, got a good grounding then uh, by uh, working with other crews and by yeah. understanding what's really, going on. And really, you know, we, we you know. It, it, people were very generous, and, and, and I would say over the years, I found that um, people in our business, as competitive as it is, um, are very generous with helping uh, people starting off, people wanting to learn, uh, very, very uh, supportive. And if I could think of the hundreds of people that, that helped me all along the way, uh, and thank them today, <laughs> Um, I would, that's one of the reasons 
I feel that I have a, a natural attitude toward uh, wanting to help people who feel the same excitement I felt about uh, about making films. Well, Haskell, you have a wonderful reputation in Hollywood for yeah. helping numerous people get along and well, give them a break and get them into the business. It's and, only and, because that's just, to, it's just the way I've been treated. It's and just exactly the way I've been treated. Well, you, yeah. you, you're very generous with your, yeah. your time to do that. A lot yeah. of people don't. A lot of people yeah. don't. Well, sometimes people don't because they're fearful and because this is a tough, competitive business. and. Um, and I think that in better times, the whole community of people in our business could be, could be better cemented. I, I think the union is one of those uh, ways that, uh, that can help that. It, your union can be something beyond just uh, wages and hours and conditions. It, it could be a statement to say that hot or cold, we're all in the same boat, and if we help each other, ultimately, uh, it will help yourself as well. Kind of the guild concept from the Middle Ages when people really made a lifestyle out of it, made a, Correct. Made a career. Well, we'd like to get back to that. That's, 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 uh, <laughs> it's that, a long road. It's a long road. Yeah. Well, Haskell, uh, we've got you going as an assistant. Uh, we followed you up now as an assistant, because this, yeah. this historical statement, so we're, they're fascinating yeah. as to where yeah. people come from. Uh, so you, you continued working out of Chicago, and uh, after working with the uh, Hollywood crews for a while, um, you came back with more experience, and you could make your own films better. And uh, yeah. ob yeah. from from what you're saying, you uh, already had a social conscience, which is another mm -hmm. fabulous reputation you have. You just can't mm -hmm. get that very easily. To um, uh, you already always have mm -hmm. uh, had a, a different uh, a social conscience to your to your work to to your body of work, mm -hmm. and. Um, but as I say, it seemed to be coming out very early. You you mm -hmm. always worked for mm -hmm. um, uh, union productions yeah. and, and for uh, you know for charitable organizations. Mm -hmm. So we we've got you working in Chicago now. This is like about the what, early '50s by this time, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you're um, uh, moving along. Uh, you got to be a director of photography in Chicago doing commercials, from as, from what I understand. Also, yeah. is is that what happened? Yeah, there were in those days. They weren't at the beginning. They weren't commercials so much as uh, industrials. Mm -hmm. I would shoot for a company called Jam Handy or Wilding or Fred Niles and they made, uh, they made well I guess you could call them commercials but they weren't necessarily for television right away. Mm -hmm. And um, I also shot films for the uh, Bureau of Mines, for the U.S. State Department. Uh, actually documentaries, uh, when you mentioned social conscience, documentaries was a way for me to learn a great deal because, as you know, when you work in a documentary, you, it's a learning process. You, you don't. You, good documentaries are not made when you go in with a preconceived notion and and say this is what is, and I'm going to make I'm going to make it that way because you're, you're going to miss a lot. And so that when I worked on um, films for the United Packing House Workers or for United Electrical Workers or your civil rights films, are uh, um, films uh, of that nature, I, I learned a lot about about the people and about the issues, and um, so I say that that's one one way. It was a, it was not just I decided to make socially relevant films. I decided to make films that I was able to make, mm -hmm. and uh, and learn from them. Um, so you want to know what else is going on? I, you know, also, you know, it's interesting to me when you recount your own, when you write your own, when we have your autobiography, I, I find that naturally we construct a scenario. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure that there's a lot of things I'm saying are out of balance. A lot of things I'm saying are, um, are not totally accurate, not intentionally. Oh, but that's, that's, that's our heritage. We're, we're doing yeah. a heritage series of our own guys yeah. talking, and men and women talking about their own lives and, yeah. and, and how you see it. And not, not, we're not doing 60 Minutes. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the whole but, point. But also, and that's what I like about that. Uh, but I wanted to give myself the discipline to um, try to be as um, honest as I can because in that sense, if anything I say can be an advantage to some other younger person, uh, I wanted to. Uh, I don't want to gloss over. Um, I don't want to gloss over things in my career, which uh, may not reflect too well on me as a as a, a person. 
You know, I mean, I, I, so I'm, I'm trying to think um, of, um, I mean, I had a, a real struggle, for example, to get into the local out here, to the union out here. We heard it, about we, that. Yeah, and, and I'm sure that if you've interviewed other older cameramen, mm -hmm. you may have heard similar stories. Absolutely. What would happen to you? Yeah, well, I... Um, well, I, I had a, a long, many-year relationship with Herb Aller, who... Mm -hmm. uh, His name's he, come up a few times. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, 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 and talk about colorful characters, great guy. I mean, really good union man. He gave me the toughest time. I, I'm dying to make movies. In fact, I had people um, asking me to shoot low-budget films, and, and I, wanted to, I wanted to work out here. And... Um, and I was sitting in his office for hours, you know, and he, and, and he wouldn't even come out. Occasionally, he'd come out for lunch or something. He said, you're still here? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I said, yeah, I'm here. I, I, I want to work, you know. I don't care what other. I'm, I'm pro-union. I want to work. I'll pay my dues. I won't undercut anything. I want to work. Uh, well, you can't do it. So finally, uh, Disney had a back door, a non-union back door where they would shoot. And where they, you would just go up there, it was like spy stuff. That you'd go up there and they would give you 40 rolls of Kodachrome. You, know? you sign a little paper and, you, and they'd say, get out of here. And, you're supposed to, and then you'd go up in Colorado somewhere and with my Bolex and mm -hmm. I'd shoot a beaver or some goddamn animal. I know. <laughs> you know? And so, so then, and, and it was all, and so, um, and so I went into Herb Aller and I said, look, here's a big company. Disney and when they're doing all this all this work and everything uh, Why don't why don't you go after them and, and sign them with the union? He said well, he says our, our guys don't want to sit around for two weeks in moose shit to get one shot, you know so <laughs> so, so, uh, so it was sort of it was beneath uh, it was beneath union um, Union consideration at that time, so I was out of sight of that. We'd all like to sit in moose shit these days. <laughs> yeah, to get right. to make I was sitting anything to get a shot. I'll tell you. But um, and just, I mean, just the way the union was about television when it started. You know, I mean, television was for for amateurs. It was they didn't think yeah. it would be a successful and, and, and actually, the 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 uh, union was is backward in, in trying to uh, uh, to organize aggressively, particularly in the West Coast, where they had more of a chance. Um, I'm trying to think of career-wise. Well, then, of course, when I lived here, I, I worked in, in Greece with Elia Kazan on a picture. But you had moved, though, I mean, from Chicago oh, to moved. Los Angeles. Okay? I moved, yeah. And, and, and in fact, I made, I shot a number of features under a number of pseudonyms. Oh, really? And, oh, yeah. Um, uh, out of Chicago or, or no, I was living right here, shooting right here on La Brea and shooting all over. You know. what, what were some of your synonyms? Steak out on Dope Street was the first one. Yeah. Uh, Anna Lucasta. What'd you call yourself? Uh, Mark Jeffrey, mostly. Okay, Mark Jeffrey. Yeah, my my have two sons' names. Uh huh. And um, uh, then um, uh, there I shot a lot of uh, Phil Jordan was a a, a, a lawyer who produced films and he would get blacklisted writers to write the scripts and uh, so we get them really cheap mm -hmm. and um, and he would he would make like uh, like one film I made with Vince Edwards who later became it I mm -hmm. made a film with Eartha Kitt mm -hmm. and I would make the whole film uh, Lucian Ballard would shoot like a week in the studio all union mm -hmm. and then then the rest of it uh, I would shoot with this phantom outfit. We'd shoot in the producer's house. We'd shoot in San Diego Pier. Uh, you know, hit well, and run. It sounds like you were also being involved in more than just being the cameraman. You were you were, uh, on the set uh, helping produce it, helping to make the show work. Um. Yeah, and uh, they had guys to do that. But in low budgets, you know, everybody does. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really low budget, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so I did quite a few of those, and um, and I learned a lot too. And then um, what the hell happened? Oh yeah. Well, and then also I kept bugging Herb Aller. And I said, yeah. "Look at," I said, "I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I won't tell you where I am, but I'm working in this town. I want to work union. I want to work with union people." Mm -hmm. And um, 
So he said, well, if, he, if we have, if all the assistants are working, I'll call you. So uh, to, if one day, whether it was the, really the truth or not, I still don't know, there was a job on the Ozzie and Harriet show. And so I went on as an assistant. And uh, I got in, I think I needed, I think I needed, what, two or three weeks, I forget the name. Anyway, mm -hmm. I got the required time in to get in. And I had been a member, I was on the executive board of the Chicago local. Sure. And I, I tried to get a transfer, forget it. You know. Nothing, yeah. So, um, um, so I guess that was the thing that broke it. It was also the fact that I had threatened and I was so persistent that I, I don't know whether he cooked up this thing for me on the Oz and Harriet show. In any event, I got on the local, for which I am very happy, uh, and I think that uh, uh, I think that it, it was important to be able well, to work in the another MC. star from the Ozzie and Harriet show. <laughs> that's that's the way I see it. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but you got in and uh, yeah. uh, as an assistant. And as an assistant, but then I went very quickly to director of photography. I never worked. As a, uh, I never worked as an operator. The first, my first legal picture was a picture with Henry Fonda called The Best Man, which I shot um, through Columbia Pictures. Well, how did you achieve this? Uh, you um, got people to say, I want to hire you as a director of photography because you've been doing this. Yeah, well, yeah. they had seen, uh, actually, they'd seen some of the low budget films I'd shot. And uh, I think that I mean, America, America was before that, too. they would seen America, America. And the, and the guys, the producers were new producers, and they um, and they thought the way it's happening today, they thought, well, they have a, a, a young kid who is a hot shot, and uh, they'd rather hire him than some uh, old knowledgeable guy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so that's what uh, I think that that that's what happened. And, well, but also you were a documentarian, and you, you had uh, yeah. doc, uh, quite a quite a reel behind you by this point that you can show to folks. This oh, is yeah. uh, you know we can we can show up on the set sober and on time and get the show done oh, yeah, I think for their budget. That has, that has a lot to do with it, Haskell. I, I think sober had one of the things because uh, many of the old timers were you know possibilities of having drinking problems. Drinking was much oh, it's much bigger in Hollywood. Big, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. That was, um, so and also I, I did things on that film which were not generally done because I, I never I had never shot process before so we had a shot for example of Henry Fonda in the back of a car mm -hmm. so uh, I said well where's the car and he, and he goes there was no, there was even no dialogue in the shot it was just a scene of Henry Fonda was playing the president of the United States it's a pretty good movie Gore Vidal wrote the mm -hmm. script mm -hmm. and so forth um, so. Uh, they said, well, no, we're shooting that on the stage and we're all processed. I said, oh, Jesus, process. I don't know how to do that. So I said, <laughs> so, Find out quick. Yeah. So, um, uh, so I said, well, why don't we just get in the car and I'll shoot it. And so, and so Henry Fonda was the one. He says, well, great, let's do that. So I sat in the front right seat, which doesn't sound very radical today. With I had a CM3 mm -hmm. uh, 35 millimeter eclair camera. And I sat there. In fact, I did some, I did some shots where I shooting outside, you know, seeing the scenery going by and then panning over and, and to Henry Fonda sitting in the back seat. And, um, and, and Henry thought it was great. You know, of course, the camera sounds like a coffee grinder, but it didn't matter. Because you know? the car was going, was yeah. driving down the street. Yeah, and there was no lines. But anyway, so the people in the studio said, well, that's pretty good, you know. I think they thought it was pretty good because they saved themselves money. With, they wouldn't have to didn't have, have to be on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Hire all yeah. those people. Great, yeah. great. So um, well, that, for its time, I mean, you're talking about putting some yeah. lights into the in, inside the, the the car so that. Uh, I, uh, actually, I didn't. I, I made a stop change when I, when okay. I was outside. I went. I went stop sign. I was. I don't know. What it was about. F, I forget what it was. It was, but it was about two stop stop change. Mm -hmm. I did. I did the stop change as I was going through the body of the car, and um, actually, I had on. A 32 to 140 Ingenue Zoom, mm -hmm. which is a short little, I wish I had to tell you, it's a very good Zoom, it's just this long. Mm -hmm. It's really good for, for cinema verite type shooting. And um, so I was able, after I got him in the back seat, I was able to move in like that a little bit. And, 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 and since the car was moving, it wasn't a gratuitous move, it was, it was pan over on him and like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm, even as I tell you, 
I remember the thrill. I still, I, I still get it now, and then, but I remember the thrill of shooting good shot. I mean, actually, also, since we have operators a lot, we miss a lot of it, but just looking through the hole and seeing it all take place, you know, and also wondering, Jesus, did I do it right? Did I stop down too much when I went in and so forth? But, you know, um, it's, there's a lot of excitement. Well, Haskell, we always feel you know, that same excitement. You kind of radiate yeah. it, uh, that you really mm. enjoy what you're doing and what you really mm -hmm. uh, uh, love the thrill of it. So the, the, yeah. the adventure of, of making a good shot is, always comes through with you, which is one yeah. of the delightful parts of you. So <laughs> we're feeling it at this end. Um, well, so you, you established yourself as a uh, cameraman then fairly quickly. Yeah. Uh, and this was year-wise, what, about 1956, 57? Yeah, around then. Around then. I'm just trying to chronalize things yeah. for the record. Uh, and, uh, and then you uh, started making bigger pictures. Uh, yeah, the Virginia Wolf to, came in. Uh, uh, was it? That was I'm about trying to think of, I think, I'm trying to think, I made some other pictures. I made some pictures, um, I made a picture in uh, Florida mm -hmm. called Angel Baby with George Hamilton and Mercedes McKinneybridge and it was about a faith healer and all, all this, of course, is black and white. You know? Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah. ask you. This is all you worked up to. All this black and white. Has all been black and white to the to the fifties, and, and yeah. so you were very. Is this by choice or by? Uh... Uh, no, except for the early documentaries, which were in Kodachrome, you know, mm -hmm. sixteen. Mm -hmm. But um, and of course, I assisted on Technicolor pictures mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. with the three strip. And yeah, but um, no, it was just the way pictures were, black mm -hmm. and white. Mm -hmm. The best if, man was black and white. If you were in the lower budget ends. That was it. There was oh, no, yeah. there was no there choice. There was no, actually, I don't, there were very few color pictures made. Well, except, color negative didn't really become. Yeah, except, uh, except, yes, you're right, uh, except for the three strip mm -hmm. Technicolor, and that was big time. Mm -hmm. um, so, that, that take, let's just talk yeah. about the black and white for a second. Yeah. That takes a whole different eye than, uh, than color. I mean, color, it seems that uh, it's a little bit easier in a number of ways. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, black and white. You really have to have uh, your your lighting be very yeah. hard and uh, or not. Uh, but d can you talk about that for a second? Your your techniques. Well, of, uh, it just uh, black and white. You can you can separation as as they call it. Mm -hmm. right? In order to make the image three dimensional, requires um, uh, a knowledge of of what light does in relation to the background and to the key and the fill and so forth and top light. Uh, whereas, um, not to deprecate color, but uh, you have an added advantage with color is you have color can separate you. You can light me sitting here extremely flat in, or full in, in color, and if there's a good color separation mm -hmm. between me and the background, uh, it will look reasonably three dimensional and, Stand out. and, and interesting. Mm -hmm. Whereas in black and white, uh, particularly with the with the conventions of black and white shooting in those days, which you probably remember seeing, people always walked around with a, a top light on their head. Always a hot, had a top light. A hot top light, mm -hmm. right? And that was the fastest, easiest way to uh, separate someone from the background. Background being kept down. Um, so, and then also filtration and and, and um, knowing knowing the filters uh, in black and white. It was important. a use of a lot of greens and uh, uh, well, uh, hundreds, hundred. I know all. <laughs> I mean, you start with uh, the uh, arrow one, arrow two, G, uh, twelve, um, twenty-one, twenty-three, twenty-five, twenty-six. Those are the getting into the reds. Mm -hmm. The uh, twenty-one was an interesting filter because it was an orange filter. Mm -hmm. The red filters darken the sky, built the contrast but also made flesh tones white, mm -hmm. almost too white. Mm -hmm. um, then there was also combinations of filters you use, filters for day for night. Um, um, most filters, most concern for filters was controlling the sky. Uh, a common newsreel filter was a G filter, which mm -hmm. was a, a, a yellow, a, a deep yellow filter. Mm -hmm. uh, so all that, but those are like, I mean, there are things in color now which are commensurate, but the, um, the ability to shoot black and white uh, is, a, is a special skill. Well, that's what your yeah. reputation was, and that's yeah. what your, your style was. And, mm -hmm. and uh, 
that was why, uh, you know, mm. it, it going on towards a, uh, mm. a little further on, um, you know, people would call you to, to do movies to, because that was, that was the look that they wanted. Is that, mm. is that true? I don't, I, I don't, I never know really why people want me or don't want me. <laughs> I find out, but I just don't, I don't really know. And also some people, certain myths develop about anyone, famous or not famous or work or not, certain ideas, because you know, we deal with so many people in the world, you like to be able to say, well, he's a this or he's a that, or he's okay for this, but he's not okay for that. And of course, you see that in its nakedest form in commercials. You know, mm -hmm. when you they want to hire a cameraman to shoot a commercial, well, can he shoot? Can he shoot apples? You know, mm -hmm. right? can he shoot apples? Or is he good shooting uh, birthday cakes? Or this this commercial is about a, you know, uh, and, and you feel like saying, look, I'm a photographer. I I I, I can shoot what I can shoot. Mm -hmm. well, so people are a lot that way about one another. Is they want to say, well, he is this kind of a guy. Or he, in my case, sometimes I've heard, well, he only wants to make political things, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, politics is just one aspect of what I'm interested in. I mean, I, and, uh, but those things come not so much, they come from the convenience of others so mm -hmm. that they can put a label on somebody and then they don't think too much about them or investigate them too much. So um, I don't know why, but I did get a lot of good breaks. So the, um, it's some of the um, early non-union pictures, uh, like Steak Out on Dope Street, one of them I made with a director, Irv Kirshner, who mm -hmm. was, that was his first feature. Subsequently, he's directed many features, you know, features with Barbara Streisand. He did, I think he did The Empire Strikes Back, and uh, he's a very good visual director. And he was assigned to do a picture at uh, Warner Brothers that, um, called A Fine Madness with Sean Connery. And, uh, I, and he wanted me to shoot it because then I was legal. All, all the previous years I, I was not legal. Mm -hmm. And um, it was at that point when we were at Warner's that, um, that um, Mike Nichols was planning to do um, Virginia Woolf. Mm -hmm. And Harry Stradling was set to shoot it, Harry Stradling Sr. <clears throat> and uh, we were, um, um, Mike Nichols and Harry Stradling came out of a screening of um, Eight and a Half, which is a Fellini film about a director struggling with to make a film and so forth. And uh, Mike Nichols was quite moved by the film. And Kirshner and myself and Harry Stradling, Mike Nichols were walking down the street in, uh, on Warner Brothers' lot. <coughs> and, uh, and Mike was saying, God, what a, what a terrific movie. And, and of course, I think Mike was probably em emphasizing, <coughs> empathizing with Fellini because he was a director struggling to make a film. And Harry Stradling, which is a very outspoken guy, he said, ah, I think it's a piece of shit. <laughs> and and um, so Mike, and, and which was the wrong thing to say. It, 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 Stradling, Harry Stradling was a fabulous guy. He thought, always would say exactly what is on his mind. He was a good cameraman as well. And um, so I think that, and Mike Nichols was really shocked, and I think that that was the beginning of some kind of estrangement between the two mm -hmm. of them, because the next I heard of this whole thing was that Jack Warner called me into his office, and it was like a real Hollywood office. It was a big thing, and he had a desk, real big wood desk, real high, and he said, so, he said sit down, son. Now, uh, I want you to uh, do this picture with Mike Nichols. He wants you to do this film. So I, I said, well, uh, Mr. Warner, I can't because I've signed uh, with uh, Irv Kirshner and Jerry Hellman to do A Fine Madness. So he says, no, you're going to do, uh, Mike wants you, and they, you're going to do this picture, Virginia Woolf. So then I repeated myself. And then he said to me that, um, he said, uh, you know, it sometimes it blurs in my mind because it has become such a cliche, but he said, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you won't work in this town very much anymore unless you do the <laughs> film with Mike Nichols. And um, so yeah, he's I, someone who could make that stick. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I said, and, and you know, I was quite impressed being in, in that office and everything. So I said, well, um, 
okay, well, I'll, I'll just have to talk to them. So I, I talked to Jerry Hellman and to Kirshner, and they were pissed at me. But fortunately, I knew uh, Ted McCord, which was an old cameraman, very good cameraman, and, and I asked, and he had been, he'd retired, but he was in good shape and able to shoot, and so I sold Kirshner on the idea of getting Ted McCord to shoot it, and, um, and that's how I got the job on Virginia Woolf. Well, that was a hugely successful movie. The, the look on it was yeah. um, uh, very mm -hmm. gritty, uh, as mm -hmm. they say in the time, and, and like very mm -hmm. real for the time. It had yeah. a lot of camera movement that uh, was unexpected, I think, by audiences, and, and you got an awful lot of uh, praise for it. Uh, I did. And, and it worked well for you. That was a, it was a big break. I got a lot of crazy. And you remember earlier you were talking about people who help you. <clears throat> there were, um, I didn't have a lot of experience in studios, and particularly in complicated stuff for people moving around. And there was a, <clears throat> a gaffer named uh, Flanagan. Mm -hmm. And he had his regular crew, including a guy in the dimmer. I, I don't remember his name. But I would, I would light things, you know, and, and explain what I had in mind. But I really didn't have the faintest idea how to really do it, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and these guys did it. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I mean, it's long enough since then. <laughs> it's long enough since then to admit. I mean, basically, um, without their experience and their knowledge, particularly the guy on, on the dimmer, you know, uh, because now you know, of course in color dimmers are, mm -hmm. but uh, as long as it didn't show on the walls, you know. You would be able. You could have somebody walk across, and they would come in. And as they come into a light, nowadays we probably try to put double open ends on the bottom. So you would just take it down on one light, and, and then and there'd be another 750, a baby over there. You'd bring it up just the right density, no light meters, or anything else. And um, and those guys, um, they didn't. Uh, well, I think you know. I, I let them know at the time that I appreciated it. You know. And I think that so they, they they continue to help me. Otherwise, they could screw you like that. Oh. You know, I mean, well, this you know. is Harry's crew too. Uh, I don't know whether they're Harry's crew. I know they're regular Warner Brothers people. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the Flanagan was going to uh, retire after that. Film. Old time guy. But those old guys knew so much about light. Mm -hmm. They really knew so much about light. It was incredible. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, the, the whole atmosphere on the stage is so different then. Well, first, everyone was older, mm -hmm. and guys, uh, there'd be guys in the catwalk, you know, and they, they'd a lot of them, number of them start drinking fairly early in the day, and then all of a sudden you, you might see something like uh, a trade paper drop, you know, <laughs> oh. or there's a box of cigarettes, occasionally a bottle would drop, you know, <laughs> and then they'd go up, it's all be quiet, quiet routine, then, then someone would go up and take, Harry or Fred or wherever, and take them down quietly and take them off the stage, and they call up and some other guy would would go uh, on, the, on, on the catwalk, you know. And, uh, and of course, in, in, in Virginia Woolf, uh, Elizabeth and Richard were <laughs> they're doing a higher, you know, oh. on, on a higher level of, of imbibing, you know. I mean, it's it's like um, the guy that the guy that um, that walks down the street with a paper bag around his bottle and drink, he's a drunk and a bum, but the guy that gets gas at the country club, well, he's a bon vivant, he's a sportsman, you know, well, just I, a lot depends on where you do your drinking. I, right? I read the biography of uh, those two and they were putting down a, a quart a day each. And, yeah, uh, oh, that's that in the book, yeah. And, and still stand up. <laughs> that's, that's the more amazing part. Yeah. And, they were, and they were doing their lines and, yeah. and of course the character was, were drunks. And that yeah. was part of the major part of it. And, and I understand they, they, that was exactly what they were for the, yeah. for the for the for the play for the for the movie they were they were drunk uh, to to be drunk in the movie yeah i couldn't really tell i know i know it's after lunch uh, richard particularly i felt he was three sheets of the wind off and you know but uh, well, then again, this isn't 60 Minutes. We're not looking for deep revelations. I mean, that's, it's pretty well known that those things were going yeah. on. Yeah, but I mean, to be able to act that well with, with, uh, with anything is a terrific thing. Oh, he was I, always I, amazing. Yeah, he was always, the projection amazing. of the man yeah. was amazing. Well, that got you um, an Academy Award Yeah. Uh, for Virginia Woolf. Uh, mm -hmm. That must have changed things around a little bit and helped. Uh, yes, yeah, the last black and white. It did change things around. Um, people that haven't written or talked to me since high school uh, would call or write 
and asked to borrow money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they knew you were doing well. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, I don't know how much good it did. Uh, and you know, and, and um, you sort of get referred to as whatever they say your name. They say Academy Award winner, you know. And um, um, it's sort of like a dog tag or something. Or I mean, I'm not that I don't think it's a prestigious thing. It's just that um, there's so much fortuitous luck mm -hmm. in getting an Academy Award. I, I mean, not that I don't think the photography was good, but getting on the picture, what other pictures were up, mm -hmm. the quality of the picture itself. Many times there's, as you know, there's terrific photography in some lousy picture, you sure. know? Sure. And um, so that um, I'm really pleased to have the Academy Award and I'm, I'm pleased that, that you're interviewing me because if I were some no, lesser, no, have lesser to. I think, person, I, I think we, we always <laughs> but, be but, but what I'm saying is everybody should know is if they don't know that there are a hell of a lot of elements that uh, go into uh, the the chance of winning an award. You know? Well, now, but that year, just just to be clear, the Virginia Woolf won several awards. It, what years wasn't the only yeah, one? Yeah, didn't it? did not win it for um, uh, Mike Nichols. Mm -hmm. But it was act. They got acting awards. Acting, and, yeah. And, uh, and, Elizabeth got it. And it may have even been Best Picture. Was it? Uh, was it? I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not a historian with all those things. Know. But it, it wasn't. It wasn't like you was, yours was the only award. Is what I'm only pointing. Oh out. no, no, no. I mean that's what often happens. Yeah. You know, the picture is good. Uh, on in, in in the heat of the night, for example, uh, it won best picture. It won, uh, I think, best editor. I don't know what music. A lot of things did not win it for Norman Jewison, which mm -hmm. I thought. I always think it's kind of strange when a picture wins for everything and the director doesn't get it. Doesn't you know. <laughs> And um, and of course, Mike. You know, a lot of since people knew it was Mike Nichols's first film, um, I was given a lot of credit. I did do a lot of the staging, mm -hmm. but uh, as we worked each day, Mike uh, was actually was a brilliant guy. Well, he, he came and, from being an actor. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was an so actor and and just kind of acquainted with the stage. So he knew. We um, had to... So he took. He took a lot from me, but also uh, he caught on so quickly. Mm -hmm. And many times when people, particularly at that time, would talk to me and give me, uh, give Mike less less credit than than he mm -hmm. deserved for mm -hmm. that film. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that was sort of an issue, somewhat between the two of us, between Mike Nichols and me. And I have over the years tried to. Uh, let him know that I remember, uh, I remember his talent. We well, certainly went on to make several more good pictures. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but so did you. You, uh, can, you know. now you're you're uh, mm -hmm. top ranked Hollywood cameraman. You're mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, by the early '60s, uh, and yeah. uh, um, I the first time I ran into you, I went to Chicago for the convention in uh, 60, uh, yeah, 68, yeah. and uh, yeah. you, were, you were there making making your show. Uh, you, yeah, you were Medium Cool. Medium Cool, mm -hmm. which, uh, uh, if I may get a yeah. little personal on my side for a minute, that yeah. influenced me to get into the motion pictures, really? because I saw that story, and uh, I went to it mostly because, oh, you know, kind of, uh, that I was there, you know, in, yeah. in, in the crowds, and, and that, and having seen it, but it uh, got me interested in, in making a story visually, and, uh -huh. and uh, uh, telling people, um, uh, what happened to people? Uh, mm -hmm. How how a story can can relate to modern day? Because up to that time, a lot of movies didn't relate to the the modern scene. It was no. uh, the movies were relating to something else, some some fictionalized thing or something mm -hmm. that was very different. So that got me interested in movies. So you know, good. It, it worked on that level too. But uh, Medium Cool was something you produced and directed though, as well as yeah, as well it. as photographed. I wrote it. And so this is a well. This is several years uh, after uh, Virginia Woolf, but you had been um, yeah. continuing to be a director of photography, but you were starting to branch off into other things. Yeah, was this this was good? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, there's nothing like making your own movie. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, because you're the boss. I and mean, when you know when you're a director of photography, uh, as you were saying earlier, the the um, the director is the boss, mm -hmm. and you you give your input, and you do the best you can, and um, but ultimately, it's it's um, he's the boss, and sometimes you'd like to be the boss, but uh, if you like to be the boss 
too strongly when you're on a movie. You're not, uh, you're not doing what uh, the chain of command is. The director is the captain of the ship. Uh, so it would, the medium cool, I wrote it and I um, directed it. I cast it. I did everything. Put up my own money, my own money, and my mother's money, some of my brother's money, and uh, so it was really my own picture. And it was successful. It worked. Uh, it worked artistically. It still hasn't made his money back. I, mean, I go all over the world, and people know the film, but through Paramount's creative bookkeeping. That's right. It's still on a shelf, isn't it? Uh, it's on a shelf for video. We're, we're uh, trying to get it off now. Mm -hmm. uh, Brandon Tartikoff, uh, who, who just left Paramount, uh, started lawyers to work so that they'll again release it on video. But um, there was a, it was a long fight to get the film uh, in the theaters. It originally came out with an X rating, and um, not when you saw it, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I mean, I think that. I think that every cameraman should have the pleasure of making their own movie at least once. Because I say pleasure and pain because of the response. It's great because when you're a cameraman, director of photography, uh, you can always second guess because with the authority that a director has also is the responsibility. Uh, whereas when, you, when it's your own picture, uh, you've got to answer questions from everybody 30 times a day, you know, what about this hair? What about this sweater? Is this okay? Should we shoot next door first or should we do this thing? You know, mm -hmm. so that the tremendous uh, responsibility and um, well, beyond just the create ov overt creative things. Opened your eyes to the other parts of uh, oh, yeah. what's, what's going on and, and, sure. and how important those other tasks are uh, sure. to bring a, bring a uh, project to fruition. Well, at, at, after that, um, I have a little. You, know, you started becoming uh, getting in commercial world uh, with Conrad Hall. Uh, with his, yeah. Is that around that time you started uh, teaming up with Connie? Connie? Uh, well, first I was in. Um, I had a company called Dove Films, and we made commercials. I always kept making features, but in between, uh, shot commercials. Mm -hmm. Shot all Wells Fargo commercials and Miller Beer commercials. Actually, did all, I'm not so proud to say that did. Uh, Marlboro commercials. We mm -hmm. shot um, s that four sixes ranch down in Texas. We shot uh, all these cowboys. One cowboy I visited up at the motion picture home a few years later, coughing his lungs up and and um, and dying of lung cancer. Ouch! <laughs> yeah. Ouch! Yeah, but um, yeah. So I made commercials and. Um, then I, and also I would shoot, like I'd sh when George Lucas did THX, I shot a couple nights for him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was shooting documentaries, too, around the country. So and you continue with all your interests all the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, you Always kept doing it. Mm -hmm. Which is it's a yeah. wonderful thing to do, to be able to oh, step yeah. from one, one area to another and, and be comfortable in it, and not uh, feel out of place or that, you're, uh, that you don't know what you're doing with it. Yeah, I, I always get a lot of pleasure out of, uh, I mean, working on big feature films is uh, somewhat like working in a, if it's going well, like a well-organized factory. Different people have their jobs and there's, uh, and you do it. It's not any less creative, it's a different type of creativity. Whereas on a, on a documentary or, on a, or even on a smaller film, there's more tactile response and you have a relationship with your equipment and and with the people and the guys, you know, it doesn't take you three days to learn the names of everybody and the crew. Mm -hmm. um, and even when you're setting up shots, you don't set up, sh you set on a smaller film or documentary, you set up shots of where the best shot is and not, oh, how can we keep the honey wagon out of this shot or, or you know. Uh, well, it becomes kind of like a three ring circus yeah. you know, with a large so picture. So sometime, uh, this guy, Bob Duggan in Chicago, who I mentioned who owns Studio Lighting Company, he had an expression about big movies and we have, he says, well, in these big movies, you know, you're, you're tripping over your own Doniker. <laughs> so uh, it, it does happen that way, yeah. Well, uh, the, um, uh, continuing on, uh, yeah. 
we, we also would like to, I'd like to talk a little bit about tech with you. Uh, you know, what you like to see in a pitcher, uh, how you like, uh, um, what sort of styles do you do you, uh -huh. uh, do you consider to be um, the best? Or I know different yeah. styles for, uh, for different yeah. different applications. But what do you look for in a pitcher? Uh, do you like a well sh set up shot, uh, a, a well well defined uh, sequence of uh, uh, cuts? Um. Well, as you know, I mean, you can predict my answer. I mean, it's it's what's in front of us. It's what the it's what we're given to photograph. What excites our optic nerve of how how we're going to shoot it. I mean, we can look at uh, two people sitting at a table here, you know, and and they're. Uh, they're, they will say they're very close and they're talking very intimately. Well, uh, when I look at that scene, I would say, look, at, I don't want to steady cam around them or I don't want to dolly around them or zoom in. I just want to, what they're saying is interesting enough and I think that it would convey the message of it most just by having a locked off camera set with a nice frame period and maybe with a couple of close ups just in case the editor wants to play with the time of the scene. Um, so and that would be set, that would set the style or the way, way we'd shoot, way I'd shoot it. I don't believe uh, in trying to, um, to show off mm -hmm. uh, per se. I enjoy showing off, but I, I, I feel I have to have enough discipline to, um, to have a, a show off shot. Uh, be integral with what is being showed off so that no one says, oh, it's a great shot. Why the hell did they do that? Uh, you see quite a bit of that uh, now uh, moving around stationary objects. I mean, you almost feel like the cameraman is getting bored looking at the two people. So, uh, so he's like what we do in documentaries sometimes. So you just sort of move around a little bit and um, Sometimes it's interesting and sometimes it's not, you know. Um, well, it's, you narr know. it's narrative filmmaking. It, you know, the narrative can go yeah. in so many different directions. Yeah. And, and what you're saying is that you have to go with the flow of what, what is being said and what is there to make it work. Yeah. Yes, uh, but no, are you you're okay? Also, yeah. Um, yes. I mean, I mean, in a documentary or narrative filmmaking, as you say, you um, you can't direct. You can, but you know, most of the direction has to come from the other side of the camera. You have to observe it, but which is a great tool for for feature films because then you learn what what good shots are. You learn that it can be interesting sometimes not to see a person straight on. You know, a lot of video shooting, a lot of video shoes you see now. Mm -hmm. The shots are like this or like this, and the camera's like that, and the angle's like this, you know. So there's a lot of shooting looking straight into the face, right smack into the face. Whereas in documentary shooting, sometimes just because you can't get your camera in that spot, you'll have a shot where, well, you'll see something like someone three-quarter back, and then when they when they have another line, they then they they turn at some point, and when you're shooting, you say, "Oh boy, you know, turn in that line," so that um, so in other words, not revealing, withholding visual information, mm -hmm. withholding visual information, is a very important way for a cameraman to know how to shoot a scene, uh, because then when you give it to them then you're giving them something. Mm -hmm. Whereas if every shot, no matter what they're saying or where it is with the dramatic, is uh, one of these super tight close-ups, you have no place to go. Mm -hmm. You have no place to go. And um, it's one of the, my criticisms of the disease of television shooting, which has thoroughly infected uh, feature films. And that is um, the, the close-up, close, 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 you know. There are others as well, you know, pacing. Um, what what's boring and what isn't boring, um, the um, the relationship between and this can get a little theoretical. I don't know whether your camera can stand it. Oh, but, we can handle it. But um, the relationship between 
the viewer and the image is much different on video than it is on film. Mm -hmm. It's not because it's video and film. It's because video is there for one purpose. It's to sell you something. In the main, it's to get you to be there seated in that seat and not going to the bathroom or drinking a beer or talking to your wife or being nice to your kid. To be there when the commercial goes on so that the structure of the drama has to be there so that the person's there for the commercial. The structure has to be there so there's enough uh, visceral excitement to grab you. So that the, the emphasis on video is on the tube's responsibility to keep you there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not to, and you as a person feel that responsibility. Say, you say, do it to me. Interest me or I'm switching channels. So that they mm -hmm. have to escalate the level of interest, the level of sensation uh, to, um, to interest you. And so that relationship is not, uh, and that's all motored by commercialism. Mm -hmm. And that relationship is not conducive to, to art, to cinematic art. Cinematic art is when you're in a darkened theater and you pay money mm -hmm. and you're with other people, um, there's a certain interaction that happens um, with a good film. In other words, the good film, good film doesn't have to reach out and grab you and say, sit here in the theater. The good film says, involves you. Oh, you, you discover things. You see something in the corner of the frame. You see an actor look this way or that way. And uh, so there's a, there's a two, it's a two-way street type of thing on a good film. And um, because of commercialism, and um, that even is getting eroded in theatrical films. Theatrical films also have an odd, because the boredom factor is very high. I mean, even we take, we're making an interview now, right? Even, even especially interview factor, the, the boredom factor in interview. Good interviews uh, have anecdotes, they have names, they have jokes, they come to the point quickly. I mean, how, how have you ever heard a person an authority on television, they ask him a question and he says, well, uh, I really don't know. And then stop. <laughs> stop. Well, sometimes they will say, I really don't know, but then they'll go on and give some answer, right? Yeah. Or sometimes they'll uh, uh, interview, a person will just uh, stop for like 15 seconds because they want to think. Well, interviews and television don't allow for, um, for thinking time. And um, so, um, but this is all because of the system that our images are delivered to us. Mm -hmm. Our systems are delivered to us uh, with baggage. And the baggage is that we're not necessarily thinking citizens, we are consumers. Mm -hmm. And to uh, be a good consumer, to appeal to good consumers, video has to appeal to number one, the widest common denominator, or at least wide enough for those people who have money to buy what you're selling. And um, consequently, um, consequently, uh, cinematic art um, suffers somewhat. And I think that we as filmmakers and the purveyors of the image, because you know we're looking through the cameras, we're taking these images, I think that we have to think a little bit about what we do with our art and maybe have some influence, I don't know if it's possible, on those people who are, who are paying for it. Because um, it's, it's, it's a problem now. It's a really problem. I mean, we take, take, we all talk about violence, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, why do we have violence? Violence is commercial. Mm -hmm. And it's also escalating violence. I mean, it used to be, uh, to have a murder mystery that one person dies. Now you can't have a murder mystery on television without having a serial killer. Sure. I mean, you got to be, you got to be somebody that kills at least three or four, and and preferably uh, sexy women. You know, that's the other thing, or women who he 
violates, you know, so the, the, the level of violence has to be escalated and, and, and because it appeals at a higher, higher, or a lower, lower level of, um, of people viscerally. Where, where, where they don't want to appeal to people is intellectually. They don't want to cause people to think about certain things because then you're going to fragment the audiences because one person will think one way about this thing, another person will think another way, and you want everybody, you want to get everybody in there so that they'll buy the product and the commercial. And also thinking uh, is not as passive, uh, uh, is not a passive condition as, than, um, than getting your blood burning because you see somebody's head cut or somebody mm -hmm. shot mm -hmm. or so forth. So that, um, and what we want to do is we want to universally boil some blood <laughs> because if it's, if, it's, if, it's, if it's functioning and if it's pumping up, then they're not going to walk away. They're not going to go to the bathroom or talk to their wife or switch the channel. They're not going to walk away. And so showbiz, as you know, like you work, you actually shot political films for, for candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole world is showbiz. Everything is showbiz. Organized, worked out, um, when public statements are made, how they're made, what's important, who's important. I mean, like you're, ta you're from a guild. Mm -hmm. You open up a newspaper. Uh, half the newspapers, it, there, there's no section on labor. After mm -hmm. all, there's, there's more laboring people than there are business people. You know, When they talk about Christmas, they talk about the ability of stores to, mm -hmm. to make money. Sell product. We're they consumers. don't talk about the ability of poor families to buy toys for their kids. In other words, it's the way, the way of looking at the world is established by those who disseminate images to us. And, um, and while I'm on the subject uh, of union as well, I think that we're sorely lacking in union education. I mean, young people who would be perceptive have no idea what not just motion picture unions, but all unions have done for, for conditions, for health, for concern, for wages, all those things. And I think that, um, I think that sometimes when you talk to some of these old timers, maybe someone should talk about what it was like <clears throat> To work, of course, the hours and hours are escalating now to work to the, what the non-union hours be, were before. Mm -hmm. I mean, like twelve-hour day is nothing now, you know. Yeah, they they yeah. had it going pretty good yeah. for a long time. Ha Haskell, yeah, Marshall McLuhan would have nothing on you. You really think about these uh, issues about uh, the medium, and, <coughs> you know, what, yeah. what it does, and where it's going. And I appreciate that. I think that yeah. a lot of people don't have a clear concept of what what's really going on out there when we're delivering images to uh, yeah. to the public and how and, and the very uh, great difference uh, the public I mean, we've changed from a country of the people by the people for the people yeah. to of the corporation by the corporation yeah. or for the corporation and uh, the citizens are no longer as paramount it's uh, as you say they're, they're consumers and and they're treated as such which is really kind of sad and it's a uh, yeah. do doesn't bring them to where they, 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 they their foolish potential. Well, look, Jay, you talk about uh, truth, right? Mm -hmm. What are most, most of the images that are presenting us today are images to, to sell things, you know? I mean, even in magazines now, you have this beautiful picture of, a, of an alpine countryside with snow on it and so forth, and it says Marlboro's or something on the bottom right corner, the bottom left corner, it says fetal damage, emphysema, all the other things, surgeon general. Okay, you think about that. Now, these are images. These are photographers. These are things. Now, if someone says, now, in advertising, are they telling us the truth? Well, no, they're telling us, giving them the credit, they're telling us what they, they're, they, what they believe in. They're, they're side of the truth. You know, they're not going to, they're not going to tell you that, um, that there might be some harmful effects or that you don't really need, if you buy the new Lexus, it's not gonna really make your sex life better. They're not, they're, you know, they're, in other words, they're not gonna tell you those things. Um, so, that, so that we're conditioned to accept untruths. The mass of images given to us 
we know if you ask any intelligent person and say, well, is that really the truth? They say, no, 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 it's, it's, it's commercial. You know, it's just, you know. So then we say, well, then doesn't this have some effect on our mind mm -hmm. that we are willing to uh, allow for the fact that the, the majority of images presented to us in our lifetime are images which are untruths. That's right. And so we say, well, it's okay to tell untruths or half-truths if it feeds uh, the commercial state. Now, there, there are plenty of... Um, so anyway, all, all I'm saying is, but that's... I'm not going to change that, and you're not going to change that. So, I mean, no. that th those are the conditions which prevail. But we should <laughs> but, understand. That but that's I what's think going on. that certainly, like people in cinema school, people think growing up, they should say, "Okay, this is this is the bargain we have." At one time, the choice was what they had in Soviet Russia or what we have here. So I'll take this choice, right? But I think that we should we should know what the choice is. We should know what we're giving away if, and for what. And we should know as photographers what we're doing. I mean, it's like, I'm sure like when, they, when, when Hitler had this, these death camps and they had all these pipes and stuff going in with the deadly gas to kill the Poles and the Jews and all those people, there were plumbers that did it, right? Mm -hmm. And these guys, you might, if you talk to them at the time, they'd say, well, look it. I'm a good plumber. I'm a very good plumber. You know the pipe that went from Dusseldorf to Berlin and something? I put that pipe in. Very good pipe. He said, yeah, but it was going to gas chambers. Well, uh, so, well, I can't do anything about that. That's gas chambers. Anyway, you know, I got to feed my family. Well, you know, at some point, you have to say, you have to say where your images are anti-personal, uh, less than important, less than good, and when your images uh, help mankind, help humanity. Um, and that's, those, are, those are moral decisions. You mentioned medium cool. There's one a cameraman has to ask himself a question. When does he put his camera down? When does mm -hmm. he come just a voyeur and photograph whatever's in front of him? When is he himself in danger, which is happening now all over the world? Journalists all over the world are, are really physically in danger. So these are some of the questions which, particularly younger people, when we get older, by the nature of things, we sort of get set, you know. But younger people, students and so forth, should really ask what it's all about, what they're all about, what images are all about, who controls the images, what, what they say. Like I grew up when they, when I love Westerns. My whole image of American Indian was a guy that, that uh, wore war paint and woo -woo, like that, scalped people, shot arrows in them. And uh, the good guys were, um, were the cowboys or the pioneers, you know, those were the good guys. No one would said to me, well, look at the Indians were there and they were relatively peaceful and these white guys from Europe came in and beat the shit out of them and put, put poison in their blankets and gave them fire water and, and bought Manhattan from them for five bucks or something. You know, no, that's not what, that's not what movies said to me, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, same with black people, same with, uh, you know, black people for me. I mean, I didn't see any, hardly any when I was growing up. So I saw Step and Fetch It and you know, those people. And I, so, um, also ideas about peace and war and, and, and also what's, you think about Lucy's kitchen. I mean, when you think of the kitchens, that, kitchens that you saw on television growing up, they're like, they were, they were really fantastic, you know? Perfect. I mean, yeah, yeah, I know, perfect yeah. Yeah. And so being a poorer person and you see that and you say, well, geez, I'm, I'm not, I'm not as good enough or I'm, or I, that's something, wow, you know, that I'm, I'm not, I don't fit in. Yeah, what are we doing? That, that's what are we not, doing to people? That's with these not messages? me. Yeah, and um, you know, when a, when a kid gets bad, I always remember this. When a kid is bad in the old films, he 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 sent he's sent upstairs to bed. You know, mm -hmm. and you can just in your mind, I can still see the scene of the stairs of this mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. well, how many people really live like that? That's right. Not that very many. Less now. All I'm saying is all kinds of ideas 
that we get from regular dramatic films, not to mention style and fashion, you know, uh, Gene Harlow's hair, color, or uh, Clark Gable's suit, or his undershirts. I remember in one film, Clark Gable took his shirt off and he had an undershirt, a BVD undershirt. Mm -hmm. all, the, all the guys wanted to wear. So the, all kinds of things are gathered subliminally uh, from dramatic motion pictures, ideas as well as objects and so forth. So I think we should be conscious of all that. You know, as a matter of fact, the heads of studios are conscious of now with all the, with all the um, objects, all the products that they put in, what do they mm -hmm. call them, tie-ins. Yeah, right, commercial placement. Yeah, commercial placement, right. it's a big business. All of a sudden you shoot Product a scene, and all of a sudden, wait a second, cut, let's put the Oscar Mayer wiener, I think on the babe, somehow I had to shoot these people <laughs> eating these <laughs> bloody hot dogs. I mean, so I'm not doing it. So I know somebody, at Disney was had some deal with Oscar Mayer hot dogs that they would supply hot dogs for the uh, for the extras when we were shooting if we had a scene with uh, showing uh, the hot dogs you know and that goes on higher levels too with airplanes and so I mean I, I just think we ought to know about all this stuff oh, yeah. I think we just ought to know about it and, and it won't be any less good a photographer and you, and you shouldn't be un, un, unhappy either I mean I'm not when I when I say when I'm against certain of these things, I'm not. Uh, I, it doesn't make me unhappy, you know, because I just do, be aware that we're yeah, using them. The images I do that what we're, I can do, using. and I'm still I'll take a job, and if it doesn't, if it's not the greatest picture in the world, if there's a nice director or a good crew, or but <laughs> I'll shoot it. I love to shoot. So. Well, you you've made so many interesting movies, Matawan. Yeah. Uh, you made uh, the the one about um, uh, the, uh, uh, the the barrio gangs. You, you yeah. made colors. The colors. Uh, you made uh, um, uh, the the with Danny DeVito's movie with the uh, uh, the Wall Street. Uh, other, uh, other people's other, money. Other other people's money. Coming home was pretty good. And coming home. Yeah, well, you you've made yeah. so many very interesting yeah. movies. Uh, any of them stick out in your mind as uh, interesting uh, yeah. parts or, or people that you've worked with? Well, I made a number of films with Hal Ashby, mm -hmm. and Hal was an unusual filmmaker and a good friend, and um, and I miss him. You know, uh, we made. Um, he actually edited *The Best Man*, the first film that I shot. He was one of the editors. And then um, he edited in the Heat of the Night, a Thomas Crown Affair. And um, he was a very, very, very talented, sensitive mate. He, of course, he directed uh, Bound for Glory, a film I liked mm -hmm. a lot. And the last night on TV, I saw uh, Days of Heaven, which uh, Nestor Elmendros was the director of photography. And uh, at, when it first came out, I put a stopwatch and, and I, did, I did 40 minutes of that film. I, I think it's a beautiful film. And um, uh, actually, I think it's probably my uh, best photographic really? work, but I can't really take all credit for it because I was maintaining Nestor's style. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. in fact, Nestor himself uh, said that he couldn't tell, and actually, that's not, I couldn't remember either what he shot or what I shot because it's been some time in between. But I think it's, I think it's a beautiful film. Uh, the days of heaven, with all the all the beautiful um, uh, scenes with the roller skating and the 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 the, the, the fights out there. That oh the, yeah, the, the John, yeah. It was Johnson County Wars. That's what that was about, wasn't it? Pardon? The Johnson County Wars. That was the days of heaven. Uh yeah, days yeah. of heaven. Well, so it actually, it's about uh, oh god, I don't know what it's about. <laughs> It's probably why it didn't make any money. It was not heavy on plot. <laughs> it was a, <laughs> a lot of pretty pictures. Well, uh, you also involved yourself in technological innovation. Uh, mm -hmm. You always had your hand in the, the mm -hmm. newest cameras and the, and the newest yeah. uh, toys, as you were. But you, yeah. one of the main things you developed or helped develop was uh, the Steadicam. Uh, that was a, a fairly big event for a lot of mm -hmm. us. It uh, brought the camera into a very mobile situation. Uh, do you want to talk about that for a minute? Well, the Steadicam was, of course, as you know, Garrett Brown's invention. Mm -hmm. And I just... Um, I have, Garrett showed me something that he shot in the early, one of the early models of the Steadicam where he had a, a patch over one eye and a um, fiber optic tube that mm. went to the camera. And he ran around with the camera, uh, I think he had a, a little pole, like a, 
It was a fairly interesting shot, but he said that, that he lost, he kept, became disoriented looking through one eye. He saw the picture image through this, the right eye, and um, he, could, he, he wouldn't work. So that um, when he was able, able to wed the camera to video, the video is what, as you know, is, has freed the camera with hotheads and lumas and, and the steady cam. It, it really allowed, um, allowed you to get away from hand holding, where if your eye had to be like this, whatever, no matter how good you were, you had a certain amount of body movement. And um, so that I did a Keds commercial, and I, and I got Garrett to come out and, and try his device on that. And it worked real well, so that when I did um, Bound for Glory, there was a shot uh, that I, um, I hate to use the word designed, that I thought of, uh, where the camera was on, on a Chapman crane and, and Garrett stood on the crane and he came down and then stepped off the crane and went through the uh, migrant camp. Yeah. It's a classic shot. Every yeah. steady cam operator has done a version of that one. <laughs> well, part of the goodness of the shot is that the crowd was not a sophisticated Hollywood crowd. They were extras that we got up in Stockton. And Garrett walking through and amongst them with this device on him, I mean, they just didn't pay attention to him at all. He just, so he was able to walk like immediately right by people who were coming towards him and they were just relating to one another and ignoring him. And also, he, 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 was, he was pretty good with the device. Oh yeah, yeah. he's uh, still the best. Yeah. Um, let's, let's take another left-hand turn here and go to the, uh, you've been a, a member of 659 uh, for all these many years and you've been the vice president for uh, at least 10 years. Yeah. Um, how do you see the board? How do you see uh, the workings? We've talked a little bit about unions in general, but specifically, how do you see 659 these days? Well, the, I, I, I hate to say this, but I am very, very happy with the present, uh, the, the present running of the local. That doesn't make things good but the individuals have their priorities in line. Uh, George Deavy and, and um, uh, Bruce and uh, George Tuscus. And they all, um, they realize that times have changed. It took the local a long time to recognize <coughs> what was going on out there. In the meantime, the full force of anti-unionism, mm -hmm. uh, including not, not just motion picture, but nationwide was, was so strong and made so many advances that to, um, to undo uh, the, adv the um, advances of, of the studios and, and, the, and business in general and the um, stupidity of the IA in particular, to undo those things will not, it's not going to be an easy task. It'll be something like Clinton now, who has all these hopes of, of changing things, moving things around from the Reagan Bush years, <clears throat> with the best intentions, just like the leaders of our local have the best intentions, uh, with the best intentions. It's a long, hard fight, and it's a fight that is not just our business. It's it's nationwide. It began even before the um, the uh, traffic controllers. Mm -hmm. It began as a conscious onslaught on the part of the studios. I mean, I remember on RoboCop 2, for example, just to mention a specific thing, the director uh, is, was a pro-union person, a friend of mine, and I heard that they were going to go to Texas non-union. So I, I said, well, look it, to the director, go in, talk to the union, they want their people to work, see what kind of a deal you can make for our guys will we be flexible. We had to be flexible because there's so little work. And uh, he went in there and talked to George D.B. and, and uh, to Bruce, and they made, with the, with the um, agreement of the, the possible union crew, they made uh, a deal which was fair for the workers and for the company, and costing the company no more than the non-union crew would have cost them. And, uh, and the director presented this to a major studio, and the major studio says, no, we're going negative pickup and non-union. And, and so that it, it became clear to me at that particular point that, that 
it had nothing, it had very little to do just with money out of the pocket because actually the good union crew would have saved their money. They sure. would have been faster, better. The director of photography could have tried shots that he wouldn't dare true with a, try with a, with a less good crew. But it, it was a, there, there is a very conscious effort to break the union. And the union will not beat that effort by keeping lowering our standards. It won't, that doesn't work that way because they want to get rid of us completely. They don't want, and, and, and in another sense, they would never say, look, I don't want you to have your health insurance for your children. I don't want your wife to be protected by health insurance. They wouldn't be that blatant. But they will say, well, we don't want, um, we don't want to have to pay health and welfare. Now the same guy is probably a member of the director's guild, a production manager, uh, and uh, he wouldn't give up his director's guild health and welfare thing for anything. So that at some point, uh, those of us who still are pro-union have to be able to talk to other Hollywood unions and say, look at, uh, we've got the brunt of this now, but you actors, you directors, and the rest of them, you're next. In fact, it's happening right now. There are a number of films being made non-director's guild, a lot of films non-SAG, and it wouldn't happen if, um, it wouldn't happen so easily if the IA hadn't been eroded as seriously as they had, and if there were solidarity between these, these uh, guilds and these unions. Well, usually at this point in every interview, yeah. uh, I turn the microphone over to Howie, Howie yeah. Block. Yeah. Come on down, and Howie talks for a few minutes. Oh, good. And uh, then, and I know you've got a time problem, and you yeah. want to keep going, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Okay. You've been fantastic. Yeah, well, oh, good. Well, I'm sorry. Hi, Haskell. Uh, hi, Howie. <laughs> uh, this uh, interview has been going so well that uh, most of my questions have been answered, okay. but I have a couple, uh, a couple of quick ones. I know it might be unfair because oh. I know volumes have been written on this, but... Uh, from the standpoint of a cinematographer, technically, I'd like to know as briefly as we can uh, uh, your idea on, on lighting. In other words, do you uh, do you have a a, a a system or a style that that never changes, or, or how do you approach uh, photographically? How do you approach uh, each film you do? Well, I try not to have a system or style. Uh, <clears throat> I find that. Sometimes I do, you know. I mean, in the recent years, I, I've fallen in love with soft light, and I've worked on um, a lot of special lighting units. In fact, uh, umbrella lights, something that I, I have, I have umbrella lights with four 1,000 nook lights in a cross like that going in an umbrella, so I, because I like soft lights. But <clears throat> I've tried now to, um, um, I, I try now to mix it up in a film. I think that soft lighting can be very boring after a while. It's pretty, but I think that somehow visually it can be boring. So I try to um, have some scenes either with hard light in or soft light scenes where I may, if it's a daylight scene, take some really hard light and, and, and just hit across the bodies, hit across the faces. Um, uh, try to have some aspects of the frame out of control, three, four, five, six stops, overexposed or underexposed. So that, to answer your question how I, uh, specifically, um, I probably subconsciously have some style or something which is pleasing to my eye, uh, which is in most of the films I shoot, but I also try to, uh, to break it to experiment, you know. Well, that's great because see, you had mentioned something before that, that I, I've run across and most cameramen have. Um, how are you with women? Are you, are you, can you photograph food or dogs or kids? You know, and, yeah. uh, and uh, my retort always has been as yours, that I'm a professional cinematographer and yeah. I can shoot uh, anything, you know. So uh, uh, it was interesting to me and I guess a lot of people watching this uh, you know, if, how you approach your lighting uh, on, on, a, on a film, source lighting or, or whatever. And a lot great. of little yeah. things recently, like um, uh, light, lower source light. I mean, you, you, in past times, you wouldn't, 
have low s source lights except um, for, s for scary stuff. Yeah, Dracula lighting. Yeah, example. Dracula. And um, a lot of times uh, I use Japanese lanterns or Chinese lanterns sometimes. And, um, and I've noticed a number of films now too where the source light is, fa is about this low. So it's not really up like that, but it's low, it gets into the eyes, and it has a pleasant look. It's like a, a lamp light in a room at night, you know. So that there are a lot of styles and things which people are trying, or bounce light. Uh, I did some shooting on um, Black Stallion Returns, and um, just for the hell of it, I, I took, uh, I put white, I put foam core all over the ground in a certain scene, and I bounced 12 Ks. It was because the shots were all, it didn't show the floor, it didn't show the people's feet. And so hit 12 Ks into the ground, and so everyone was lit as if it was sun hitting the the floor and bouncing up at them, and it looked great. And I, I got the idea by seeing, actually seeing that on the pier that we were shooting, that the sun was coming in like that. And um, so that, so, so I do change things, you know, and I, and I notice other photographers, we're very faddish somehow, that we start seeing some, uh, like in A Few Good Men, I, sh I shot a day on that for Bob Richardson, and I noticed that he, Although he has soft light, he also he has places where you have may have a hard piece of light that just goes across the chin like that, or so that um, a lot of guys are doing similar things. I know it's it, it's it yeah uh, it it's not formula uh, lighting. There's no question about it. Yeah. Uh, another tricky question: What are your plans for the future? What? Do you have any plans for the future? Yeah, well, my... We're not getting any younger, that's right. Uh, I, I really love to direct my own films. I've directed two films. I did Medium Cool and a film called Latino. And I really, uh, I really want to do that. But I, apparently no one else wants me, at least no one else with money. My mother wants me to. Um, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll probably shoot... Uh, I talked to John Sales yesterday, and he's going to do a film in Ireland. He asked me to shoot that. Rob Reiner is going to do a film that he asked me to shoot. Uh, um, and also, I, I'm planning to do um, documentaries, and, I, and I'm going to go into shooting video. I've been shooting with my little Hi8 camera, and um, I've been going out with these guys they call video vultures. They're guys who rent themselves out to majors. Uh, video to to stations, channels, and they shoot um, they shoot basically they shoot violence. They shoot uh, drive-by shootings, drug things, you know. And um, they go to work at nine o'clock at night, and they have police calls in their car and and um, telephones and all that stuff. And I, I went out with them a number of times and made an eight millimeter video of of what they do. The last night I went out. I had one drive-by shooting, one drug bust, uh, one high-rise fire, one motorcycle down, and the guy said it was a slow night. You know, and, uh, well, what else do you do for excitement? <laughs> well, it doesn't seem to, it seems to me that you're not ready to relax. Uh, one last question, uh, Haskell. Uh, mm. Do you have any advice for youngsters coming into to our business today? Well, generalized advice to youngsters. I mean, you have kids, and I have kids who are no longer kids. And generally, you know, giving them advice doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> but if, if I would say it for posterity on this camera, I would say to um, try to live and experience a full life um, outside of film business. I find particularly film student people, their whole they, they go to movies, their ideas about life come from movies, they, they live and breathe movies, and, and movies that have been made are other people's dreams, other people's thoughts, other people's ideas. So that um, I think that like being out amongst them, not uh, live a, a so sheltered a life, which is so easy to do in, in California and Los Angeles, uh, can only make you a better filmmaker and, and make you a better person. So, um, 
I would say like if you're going to school and cinema school, don't just go to cinema school. Uh, study history, uh, literature, art, uh, dance, whatever interests you, sports. Um, because the fuller person you are, the more capable you are to uh, be a better filmmaker. And I think a director of photography should be a, f a filmmaker and not just a technician who exposes film and gives it to the lab. Well, that sounds like great advice, advice to me, Haskell. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, the local appreciates it. Jay appreciates it, and so does Bobby Feller. I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to hand this microphone back to Jay. Okay. Who will? Well, okay. Jay will off. no, I just, I think on that note, we should sign off. Haskell, okay. uh, thank you for your time. I know you've got to go. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's been a delightful interview. And uh, we hope to see more of you and more of your terrific work uh, as it moves along. Thank you, Jay. All right. Thanks very much. As we fade out. As okay. we fade out. Okay.